As you watch today's video, we encourage you to take a look at the companion guide, which will help you to plan, as well as the winter game guide, which Andy will go through many of the games, and you can follow along. Welcome everyone and happy new year. Hope this break has treated you right. In order to charge up for the new year, we wanted to send this short video with some support for returning well to school recess and all the great work that you'll be doing in 2024. So welcome to the recess winter boost. In this video, uh, you'll find ways to explore how to think about what kids need in their return to school, um, to be able to identify and assess spaces and what game possibilities exist in them to create a plan for resetting expectations, which we'll all need to do uh, as we go to mostly indoor recess in the winter, uh, and reflect on ways to support growth for staff, students, and yourself. Um, this is kind of like a springboard to the target. Um, so it might not get us all the way there, but it's a great way to start. You've seen this slide a bunch, and I think that it's important to keep ourselves oriented to what our goals are for students, these social emotional skills, uh, and then how we get there, uh, our coach behaviors and program activities. So you'll see those come up uh, throughout the course of this video. Uh, and you can think of the ways that uh, some that you identify uh, would be really important. Um, this is uh, another reminder to the pyramid of program quality. Um, so uh, though we have gone through creating safe spaces, um, and went through our skill building training. We'll do another one um, in February about building independence. Um, the resetting and restarting of recess and school in the winter, I think, brings us back to the need for that safe environment, that foundational um, stuff on the base of this pyramid. So uh, keep your focus on those things as we go forward. So I think the foundation of great recess is indoor games. Um, we have so many tasks and hats that we wear as recess coaches, um, and that all begins with leading great games. So I wanted to talk about um, some different spaces that games happen in, uh, what you might need to play in those spaces, and then some ideas for each of those spots. So um, you might find yourself in your classrooms uh, in a multi-purpose room uh, that has you know more or less space more or less other stuff in it um, some schools use gyms uh, many of you have old auditoriums that have a lot of students in them at the same time um, and uh, some schools may use hallways uh, and places like that so there are lots of spaces in school buildings and each of them, as you see on the right, has different conditions that they need. So um, different ways of moving, uh, different requirements for sound. Um, you can imagine classrooms, uh, if there are other classes in session nearby that you'd have to be much more quiet. Um, there are other situations where whole floors will be at recess at the same time. Um, so maybe the restrictions are a little bit different. Again, this is all about what's going on uh, with the spaces and assets of your school uh, and what uh, conditions and norms you set out for movement, for noise, um, for uh, what we expect to be able to do with kids. Um, so this is just a guide to think about that a little bit uh, and something definitely just discuss with your administrators and your recess team. Um, one thing to note is that when you think about ways to advocate for these spaces being used, which I think is going to be something that you may need to do, um, I want you to think about what conditions might other people be concerned about. How can you, when you're advocating, express how these conditions will be met and how your care for uh, other people's priorities as far as noise, order, movement of students, how you're taking care of that uh, during the advocacy. So it's not just, I want to do it here, but I want to do it here, and here's how we plan to make it work for other people and other concerns. So once we've um, gotten our spaces down, we can talk about what gameplay could look like um, in each of those spaces. The, the big wide goal of recess uh, is to have physical activity and play um, that is in indoor spaces more necessarily controlled than it is um, in outdoor spaces. So that might seem like a limiting factor, and in some ways it is, um, but we also get open to the possibility of different kinds of games, uh, a little more intensive learning, um, some 
more reflection for students in ways that could potentially make your return to outdoor uh, even more productive. So let's go to it. Um, in each of these spaces that we'll explore, I um, want to give kind of a tagline. So, so classroom recess is all about like controlled ways to be active. Um, so some great ways to do that are four corners uh, where you have a person in the middle, uh, everyone else tries to move uh, in rounds to one of each of the corners, uh, and the person in the middle tries to um, say where the most people are. So they close their eyes, people move to a corner, they say this one, um, those people you know, do a physical activity or they get out and we go until everyone's eliminated or um, go for a certain amount of time. Um, same way peanut butter and jelly tag, uh, you may know this one, um, get a book or a cone, balance it on your head, um, play tag, and if you get, if the book falls off, um, that counts as getting tagged, or if you get tagged, of course that counts as getting tagged. Um, so both great ways to have movement that's like a little bit more controlled um, by the structure of the game. Um, some great old school ones are paper football and board games with physical activity additions. So no matter what you're doing in the classroom, you can always add physical activity to it. So um, paper football could be um, that, you know, when you score, you do 10 jumping jacks or board games. If you are, are moving spaces on uh, a game like Life or Candyland, you do as many jumps as the spaces that you move. Um, so I think always indoor recess, we talked about that limitation that it's going to be like necessarily less um, wide ranging and open physical activity, but there are always ways to add physical activity to the things that you're doing. Um, in multi-purpose rooms, uh, which some of you may have access to, um, there are sometimes more options for bigger movements. So these um, lead to games like wall ball, which is uh, like a volleyball variation, put a piece of tape on the wall and use a beach ball and hit it over that line to the other team. Um, Foursquare, great classic recess game. Um, even if you have a pretty small space, um, uh, blue painter's tape on the floor um, comes up really easily, makes a quick um, court, uh, and it's a great way to keep lots of people moving through an activity. Um, Get Down, uh, you can find it in the, the games guide that you have, um, but it's a circle game with beach ball tapping, and if you tap it out of the circle, you you know lose an arm, uh, then have to be on one knee, then another knee, and then uh, only your feet to kick with, um, but it's hours of fun. Uh, Gaga Ball, classic UI fave, um, and bridge ball, that game where you're foot to foot in a circle um, trying to slap the ball between uh, people's feet again. If the ball goes between their feet, they lose a hand. Um, all these games um, can be great, have a lot of physical activity, and don't take a ton of room. So good options for a multi-purpose room. Um, I know that lots of us, too, have auditoriums that we work in. Big thing about auditoriums is that they'll often say, oh, it's a huge space. Let's have uh, 120 kids in there at the same time. Um, and that is a lot to handle. Um, so I think that the biggest thing is that in some ways, auditorium indoor recess is a little bit like outdoor recess in that stations, options for activities, guidelines of where to be and how to move in those spaces can be really good. So if you have you know, a big aisle and a stage, it's one activity on the stage one activity on the one side of the aisle, one on the other. Um, so ideas for ways to play that game um, are reverse charades, uh, where there's a um, activity or motion behind the person who's up front. Everyone else who's in the seats in the audience um, does a motion until that person uh, can figure out what they're doing. When they figure it out, they go back with the crowd and uh, the next person comes up. I think the the cool thing about reverse raids is instead of one person moving, it's a bunch of people moving at the same time. And this is like kind of an unlimited number of people uh, that you can have playing this game. So great game for big groups. Um, if you have the ability to project um, YouTube games and dances, Go Noodles, stuff like that, um, lots of great things online about um, uh, dances and 
video activities. Um, these are mostly great on the, like the go noodle tip for younger kids, um, but then obviously lots of room for like TikTok dances and stuff for older kids. Um, and then like beach ball or keeping up games. Um, I think that these ones are a little bit less organized and might be good for a shorter amount of time, um, but uh, could be great fun to, you know, crowd surf a giant beach ball, um, which are surprisingly cheap on Amazon. Um, and then I mentioned this before that this idea of stations having different things going on um, that have solid physical boundaries. So you know that over in this space, this is what's happening. Um, here's how we're moving, here's how we're not. Um, and making sure that those um, spaces stay distinct from one another uh, is a great way to um, build that sense of safety. And then in gym, um, some, some folks may have access to the gym. Uh, I know that this is probably relatively rare, um, but if you have the gym, um, one, thing that I would recommend is avoiding just like using the whole gym for a big basketball game or even two and then games that um, can involve more people um, and not just prioritize the most skilled people are, are really positive here. So knockout's a great one. Uh, keep the yard clean, um, divide the gym in half to have a timed uh, rounds where you try to throw all of a bunch of different soft objects onto the other side. Um, beach balls, soft dodgeballs, these are great. Um, only caveat for this one is that um, it can turn into throwing things at people, uh, which you definitely want to avoid. Um, four square tournament, I think tournaments and things that last through multiple days of recess are great ways to go through indoor recess. Um, the, the blues of the winter can be fun if you have something to look forward to um, when you're going to recess. Um, splats, a super fun game, throw the ball up in the air, say splat when you catch it everyone has to freeze try to tag people out from where you are um, and then for for little kids big groups sharks and minnows uh, and all the variations of that are instant classics um the hallway i think that the hallway is a really cool idea of how to use space in the gym but like i said at the beginning it needs a lot of school buy-in needs a lot of attention to what uh, effect it may have on other classrooms and other spaces in the school, um, but there's lots of great potential. Um, so cool things that you can do in those spaces are like three-legged race kind of games, um, uh, obstacle course uh, with, you know, chairs. Uh, you could do the blindfold game where you have to lead someone through things. Um, I've always loved the jump rope snake um, that you have to watch out for. So lots of cool things um, that you can do in obstacle courses and uh, leverage the creativity of your students in that way too. And then cup stacking challenges. Um, I think that buying a big uh, thing of uh, red solo cups is a super cheap and uh, inventive way to have a good time at recess. So you can do things like um, who's the fastest to unstack, who can build a pyramid, who can do these um, strange different challenges. Um, you can have people do these independently and race against each other and make teams. Um, all kinds of different fun things that you can do. Um, make a giant pyramid and have somebody run through it. Um, lots of fun to be had with red solo cups. So that that stuff is, I think, the, um, the foundation of what you start thinking about with recess is what are we going to do during this time? And as a coach, it's that is like one of your big imperatives. Um, but of course, you know about how complex your role is. So uh, it doesn't just end there. So we're going to um, offer some some tips or ideas, things to think about, um, especially as you go into this return from the year. So um, I think one of the big questions for us always and kind of has been throughout the year is uh, what does adult involvement look like? Um, what expectations do we have for what people will do? And I think it's a lot easier in outdoor recess to as, adopt a kind of um, supervisory or safety guaranteeing role as I think that people sometimes think about it, where I kind of step back, kids do their own thing. If there's a problem, then I'll step in. Um, but I think that with indoor recess, it's uh, we need to be a little more proactive with kids 
um, offering options to of what to play, um, how to do things. So I think um, the the biggest thing in, is about managing expectations. So um, managing expectations is, is the key to so many things. But here, I think especially it's about helping folks understand what they could do. Um, so not asking them to do something that you don't give them the tools to do. Um, folks may be unfamiliar with or unprepared for leading games if your outdoor recess doesn't require it. And so if you want staff to be more involved or if you need staff to be more involved, um, feel free to send them these guides. Ask for resources. Um, teach them some games to play, and feel free to connect with your manager or the learning team for more recess resources about how to um, get folks to the spot that you need them to be. Um, I think that this uh, comes back a lot to what do students need? What is the building need for recess to be successful? So this isn't about Andy asking for a security guard to do something that they don't want to do. It's about what do students need to be successful in these spaces uh, and how can we as the recess support team provide that? Um, I think that there's, a, there's another piece that's um, so crucial in, in spaces like this when people might be moving out of their comfort zone uh, is to ask questions. Um, so uh, what do you like doing? What do you feel uncomfortable doing? What uh, ideas do you have for ways that kids could play? Um, what support do you need from me? Uh, these are all great questions to ask. Um, but overall, what they do is show your care for the person, um, show that you are interested in their point of view, um, and that you want to come up with solutions that uh, take their perspective into account. Um, so asking questions is a, a huge way to, to build adult involvement and build support uh, for what you're asking folks to do. Um, and then I think last, and this is a big um, fostering growth mindset thing for you, for your staff at recess, for your school administrators, um, that all of the work that we're going to be doing in the next few months is about working towards more and better play organization uh, interaction with kids. But it's not about being perfect today. And you're you know, when we have indoor recess every day for weeks, it's not going to be perfect immediately or perfect every day, uh, but we can focus on improvement. Um, so I think especially uh, if and when uh, things get difficult with your administrators, with your students, uh, you can really lean into this fostering growth mindset coach behavior that this isn't about um, either having or not having a, a perfect thing. It's about uh, daily improvement. Uh, and so that goes for you, goes for your students, uh, it goes for everybody in the school building, uh, that we're working towards more and better, not perfect. Awesome. Um, I think a, another huge thing is that uh, our attention getters, um, the way that we connect with kids kind of necessarily has to change when we're in the building. So if we um, blow a whistle or um, shout into a megaphone to get folks back together uh, on the playground, um, that's probably not a great solution for inside the school building. So um, some cool ideas, uh, you know, you've seen this in trains that surfs up a call and response that uh, includes like a quieting down mechanism. The cool thing about a call and response is that it stops the conversation that's happening or or whatever noise kids are making to make that response. And then there's kind of a natural gap. Um, so call and responses are especially effective for indoor recess. Um, while some may be louder than others, things like um, surfs up or waterfall, which you'll see here, um, is uh, great ways to have it be a quieting down thing. Um, Brazos y burbujas, I think that I'm spelling this right. Um, please check me if I'm wrong. Um, shoulders and bubbles, it's a um, way for uh, little kids to think about how to calm down. So um, put your hands on your shoulders, Brazos, and pretend there's a bubble in your mouth. So um, that can be a great way, I think, especially for younger kids to um, get 
uh, you, for you to get their attention and for them to start quieting down. Um, clapping patterns are great. Um, you clap a pattern, they clap back. Same way, good way to get attention without yelling um, involves students. It can be a fun tradition too. And then the, um, the last one um, is like visual cues. So um, probably some folks know the Quiet Coyote. Maybe your school community uh, has a tradition uh, that's a visual cue already. Um, I highly, highly encourage you to take advantage of what's already existing there uh, and pick up on those things. Um, recess doesn't have to be brand new. There can be fun like recess only traditions around attention getting um, and also leverage the stuff that already exists um, in your school. Sweet. And then I think um, another coach behavior, we, we talked about uh, fostering growth mindset a second ago, but I think that scaffolding is so, so important for uh, recess games, for adult involvement. Um, and I think here scaffolding, um, I, I want it to mean two things at once if I can. And one is, you know, you start out at the base level and build up higher and higher. Um, and there's also the scaffolding that means um, like leveling for um, age or ability appropriateness. So um, I think with, when you think about staff involvement, scaffolding can mean, let's start, I want you to get here. And so I'm gonna build supports for you to go here and then here and then here and then here. Um, and I think that there's another way that scaffolding works um, it, in that it uh, can allow you to adjust games for uh, different age groups and different levels of interest or competitiveness or ability. Um, and I think the biggest thing with scaffolding is that you want to make sure that you're listening to your students. If they say, this is too easy, you can listen to that and say, all right, let's make it more challenging. Um, if they are struggling a lot, uh, let's add fewer steps or less complex movements. Um, so listening to, to your students doesn't mean that uh, you say yes to anything they say. You know, they say indoor recess is boring, let's get a PS5, right? We maybe can't say yes to that. Um, but you can say, I'm hearing that you're not as engaged as you want to be. Let's add more challenge. Let's add more complexity. What would you like to do? What um, is possible for us? So in general, um, I think that scaffolding can look like making games simpler, fewer steps or simpler movements for younger kids. It can be introducing complexity or challenge for older kids. So things like time, you have to do it faster, uh, smaller targets or a more precise movement. Um, more obstacles, things in the way, distractions, um, stuff like that, um, or more complex movements. And then I think that this this is a great like student voice participant choice motion, which is that uh, the you can think of the pinnacle of scaffolding as being um, creating your own game. So maybe it starts as like playing the game or understanding the game, playing the game as directed, and then making your own game, making your own variation. And so uh, we do this in summer camp. A lot of you are familiar with it's like mashup games. Um, what what would it look like to combine two games together? So I think that this is a great antidote for, for boredom, for um, stagnation and recesses to encourage your students to make up their own games. And mashups are a great way to start that. Um, this part, I kind of went back and forth um, thinking about resetting expectations that in, in a way this could be the first part of this video because it's so foundational. But I think, you know, with UI, we always want to think about playing games first um, and what do, what do games do for us? But I think the structures that we set around recess um, and especially when we come back from a two week break, um, thinking about resetting expectations is so huge. Um, so if you haven't already um, following along in your guide, I think um, I want you to think about what recess might have meant um, or coming back to recess, what that might have meant um, for you, uh, for the staff people at the school, for students. Um, this, this can take on uh, a lot of different um, colors, right? Um, so this could be a, a case where folks were feeling really burnt out and they're coming back really energized. It could be that um, the break wasn't what 
uh, kid expected it to be, or it's difficult to be home for an extended period of time, um, and they're coming with that um, kind of weighing on them. Um, for adults, it could be that uh, they weren't ready to come back, um, and that break was really uh, a nice respite, and um, they're not looking forward to coming back. I think that without making assumptions about this, we can contend ourselves with saying that this could look a lot of different ways for a lot of different people. Um, and I think that to to bring in another coaching behavior, the big intervention for that from our perspective is that we can create safe spaces. We can tell people that it's okay to be back, that people are looking out for them um, by having really clear expectations. And that's for yourself, for adults, for kids. Uh, everyone can benefit from knowing what's going to happen um, and being a circumstance that they can find predictable. I think that that only really works in its most positive way when we remember the warm welcome. So the warm welcome, remember an enthusiastic greeting by name for every kid, uh, person on staff. People will love to hear their names in a positive way when they say, I'm, when you say something like, hey, Andy, I'm so glad to see you again after this break. I missed you, right? That's a really nice thing to hear. Um, so really encourage you to um, lean into one of the um, maybe most straightforward, but certainly most important um, parts uh, of our coaching model. The warm welcome is a great way for people to uh, feel excited to be back. Um, and if you feel like someone's looking out for you, someone's caring for you, um, that takes away the need for a lot of the behaviors that may cause problems uh, at recess. So show everyone, both adults and kids, uh, that you're happy to see them. Give them that warm welcome. Um, there's a lot of complexity in our roles, uh, and this is a, a simple and important way to bring people back in. And and I think that that is, is really a tone-setting move, and I, I can't underestimate or undervalue the importance of setting that tone, that your attitude can set the norm, that the way that you approach this stuff, if recess, indoor recess is an exciting thing with a bunch of new games and different ways to play, it's a different way to look at your school building, um, different activities to do, uh, and that that's exciting and positive uh, within the guidelines that we're going to set out that can really change how kids, adults, administrators look at indoor recess. You are the leader in this space, and your attitude can set the norm and set the level for how everyone else looks at it too. So when we think of how, how do we set those good expectations so that uh, everyone can get along with indoor recess in a positive way. Um, here are some of the things, the questions that we need to answer. Um, where's everyone going to be? How will the decision be made to have indoor or outdoor recess? Is it uh, this temperature? Is it this wind chill? Um, does precipitation matter? Will we go out if it's snowing, but not if it's raining? Um, I encourage you to be really specific about this with your administrators and to have that written down so that everyone knows, right? If, if it is if it's under 32 degrees at recess time, we're not doing it. That is what it is. If it's uh, if it's not raining or it's above 20 and we're going out, that's that is what it is. If it's we're going to have indoor recess until further notice, then that can be it, the the thing too. We just want to make sure that everyone's clear, and then further that everyone knows who is making that decision. Um, the more we're clear on those two things, the more we can predict and get ready for what we're doing during the middle of this busy school day. Um, what staff will support indoor recess? Where will they be? If those people are out, who will come through for them, right? Um, you all know this way better than me. This is, this is a huge thing. Who's going to be there with me? Um, and then what guidelines around noise level um, you'll will you have uh, if you have recess in the hall or classrooms? Do we have to be, you know, level one? Um, can we be a little noisier at recess? Are there other um, rooms having class around us so that we need to be mindful of them? When we move through the halls, um, same, same questions, right? Um, so right before we get to the this piece, um, there's space in your participant guide that you can work some of those out um, and encourage you to have 
conversations about all those things with your administrators. If you need more resources or um, more specificity around um, what you'd want to work out procedurally, um, feel free to reach out to your manager or the learning team. We'd love to, to support you in that space. Um, we've talked about different coach behaviors that can be helpful kind of throughout um, creating safe spaces, warm welcome, scaffolding, um, participant choice, all great ones. Um, and I think that the the big thing is to think about going back to that pyramid, um, what's at the foundation um, and and that those things, uh, especially in this first week coming back, are going to be the most important. So, thinking about the coach behaviors that you can lean on and rely on uh, to support the return to recess and the return to school. Warm welcome. Uh, just talked about it. It's a huge one. They'll love to hear their name from you, especially if you tell them you miss them. Um, tell them you're looking forward to playing with them during the day. Um, warm welcome is so huge. It sets the tone for the day. Um, safe spaces, we we just talked about setting expectations, uh, interfering on bias, showing kids that they're protected, um, that they can be safe with you. It's just so critical. Um, and I want you to think, uh, and there's space to do that on your guide, of what specifically that's going to look like for you. Um, so this isn't like, yeah, I'm going to make sure it feels safe, but like when and where, what will you say, uh, what specific kinds of behaviors are you looking out for that you need to um, jump in and say, that's not okay. We're going to make sure everyone um, feels safe and included. Um, making a plan for that stuff is the best way to make sure that you do it. Uh, and then scaffolding. We talked about that with uh, working with adults. We talked about it with yourself. We talked about it with playing games. How can you make things the right amount of challenge? And that goes for kids and adults. Um, something that we talk a little bit less about sometimes in our coaching model, um, no less important, is that um, program activities piece. Um, the program activities are the structures that we put out. So active engagement is um, not just physically active, which is something that we at UI think about a lot, um, but how are we asking kids to go deeper in their understanding of things? So indoor recess especially can be a cool thing, a uh, cool way to explore um, you know, strategy board games like strategic or chess um, are great ways to think uh, strategically, think spatially about um, about different things in a way that we don't usually get to in outdoor recess. So how can we create opportunities for more active engagement, both physically and mentally? Um, reflection is one that we do a lot, but it, uh, it's a program activity. So um, reflection, I think that means for you, for sure, thinking about what's working, what's going well, and why. But it's also, uh, given the more controlled environment of indoor recess, we can ask students about their reflections. How did today go? Um, maybe that can be a routine or tradition that we have at the end of each session. Um, how did this go? What are the ways that we can reflect on it? Um, and then I mentioned this one earlier, that participant choice is such a hugely positive one. Um, how are we offering options of ways to engage? Uh, what we want is for people to be physically active um, and learn things about themselves and build social emotional skills. And there's a million different ways to do that. How are we offering choice in those spaces? Um, and then that's just about it for us. Um, we're gonna have a um, code pop up for more um, resources for some feedback for this. Um, but I think that most of all, most importantly, I want to uh, say that I'm excited for your indoor recess. And if you ever want to talk about um, more games, more ways to integrate social emotional learning, more ways to work together with staff or administrators, um, your managers, myself, uh, your program directors, we're all really looking forward to having those conversations. Um, and I'm I'm just really excited for it. Um, so thanks a ton for watching. Um, feel free to reach out anytime, um, and I look forward to hear how it's going.